what he did to me next, I literally begged God to let me die instead of live. I had no will in me left after everything. My name is Mary McDowell. I'm here to tell you about being a human trafficking survivor, but also to know the signs of people that are being trafficked, what you can do to help, just overall facts of what can happen, what normally happens, and then part of my story. I was a teenager. Um, I moved to a small town named Saxe, Texas, much smaller than what I was used to. I, I lived in Garland most of my life and moving from one city to another, obviously my community of friends were a little different. I had to learn how to meet new people and kind of gauge a new friendship group. Middle school was really hard for me. I was bullied a lot and my relationship with my parents were really strained. I think a lot of it was because my mom's depression and my dad being gone all the time. He was an armed guard, so he wouldn't get home until 9 or 10 o'clock at night. And I really honestly was kind of just left to my own devices, <laughs> being able to cook, clean, do my homework. And my mom would be in her room sleeping or just not really attentive to my needs. And so... Once I graduated middle school, after three years of, like, torture, I thought, oh, I'm finally free. Um, I can finally start kind of expressing myself. I got older, and my mom really hated. I mean, she was just adamantly against what um, I wanted to dress like, what I wanted to do. Um, I was really into punk rock and goth, and they were just like, oh. And I got a lot of, um, just a lot of agitation for my mom because I wasn't exactly what she wanted. So I started hanging out with a group of people at school and soon met the girl that got me into what started this whole, I would say, hell. That was what it was, was hell. I started working when I was 14 years old on servers. Um, so I got used to the internet really quick. I knew how to navigate it really quick. Um, once I started learning how to navigate it, um, I learned about chat rooms. I learned about like AOL, all the, the new and fancy stuff. And my mom and dad had just bought a really big, brand new computer for like my mom to do work for, um, she was a school teacher. So she did her work for school on that. My dad used it, even though he didn't even know how to really use it. And then I used it for games and then music because LimeWire was a really big thing back then. So my trafficking started at home. I was introduced to men online in chat rooms on AOL. My friend gave me a webcam, and she said, hey, well, I know your mom and dad aren't really giving you any money. You know, you're not really getting an allowance, and you want things. This is a neat way to make money, and you can have the money sent to my house because her mom was a drunk. She never paid attention. She was able to go out. I mean, some of the outfits that she would wear would make you think she was probably a prostitute or something else. And she was older than me. She was almost a senior. So she was like 17, 18 almost. And so she got me into this online and I met several men online that wanted to have online shows from a young girl. That's what they got. And in return, I got clothes, bags, money. I got um, gift cards. I got all sorts of stuff. And I started to feel accepted by these men because I really wasn't getting the attention, the nurturing at home that I really needed. 
And what I didn't know was the, like, intent these men had. I, I thought it was just, like, in attention for me. My trafficker was a little bit different. He was more laid back. He wasn't so fast to ask me for anything. In fact, he never asked me for a photo. He never asked me to do anything live on camera. All he wanted was me to talk to him. And so we began kind of a friendship. And he said he was 21. And I said, well, I'm 16. And so we started talking. And over time, um, I started telling him about what was going on at school and how I was still getting bullied, how I didn't fit in. And um, he would just sit there and listen. And he would nurture me kind of like a dad would almost. My mom and dad bought my first cell phone for me during my 16th birthday. Um, what they didn't know was I was calling men from all over the U.S., at night, they would want phone sex. They would want somebody to tell them what they wanted done to them. And I would oblige, again, for money or something in return. Um, and it felt good for me, again, because I was like, well, I'm getting attention. These guys like me. I mean, I could tell you probably the oldest voice I heard was probably somebody that was an elderly man to somebody that was about my age. And again, this was all like off of AOL in chat rooms. We would go and we would put like little hashtags out or a little sign saying, you know, age um, is age and where you're at and um, are you single looking to like date or are you looking for somebody to talk to? And that's how we would basically lure, you know, these guys' attention to us. And a lot of people say, okay, that's prostitution. First of all, a 16-year-old can't be a prostitute. They don't even know what they want, much less at that time, make that decision for themselves. And so I didn't see anything really wrong with it because from my perspective, I just didn't feel wanted. Um, my family really just kind of didn't make me feel wanted. I really felt like neglected alone. Um, like I didn't really belong. So I talked to him online and it wasn't until my parents found out about me talking to other men that they, I mean, they just lost it at that point. They got mad at me. They took my phone away from me. And I ended up getting, I guess, kind of like a burner cell phone. I'd have to turn it off. My friend would sit there and tell me when I could turn it on and stuff like that. And I'd wait for my parents to go to bed. And I had it in my closet, like hidden, where they couldn't find it. I put it in one of my old tennis shoes that I barely wore anymore, except to mow the lawn. And it stayed off until I needed it. And it fit my Nokia cord. So we were, we were good to keep on going. I had that cell phone. My friend paid for it. She made more money than I did. She had more men interested in her and had built up a group of men that regularly contacted her for her services. I really just got lost because I thought that this guy was going to be my friend and help me. And I called him on the other phone and I said, hey, um, my mom and dad took my cell phone from me. I really need to talk to you, be online at this time. And so... I would get online, I would shut the door, shove a towel underneath the door so that my parents couldn't hear the little dial-up noise. And I got on there and I typed out everything to him. And he said, how about this? How about I come to you? And so it took him roughly like two months. 
Uh, it took him two months to get to me. He came from Colorado, and there was periodic times that I didn't have any contact with him, but he still had the number to the burner phone. And so he would call me late at night, like once my parents were in bed, and he knew that it was safe to call. And he would let me know where he was at. Um, he rode the Greyhound bus to Texas. And then he said, hey, we need to meet up um, eventually. I want to see your face. He goes, I've got to talk to you. I've gotten pictures of you, but I've never met you face to face. And so initially when I first met him, I, I kind of felt like something was off about him and he didn't look his age. And then I assumed because he smoked, maybe that's why he looked older than what he was. But he told me about his daughter and that how, you know, her mother died, wasn't in her life. And he thought that I would be a really good person to step in and um, be a mentor to her. And it was about then that I said, okay, I'll go with you. I just, like, I want to wait a little bit longer to get to kind of know you before I leave. And things at home started to deteriorate. Like, just everything was rolling downhill for me at that point. I remember meeting him just prior to, you know, everything happening. And I said, I need to go now. Like, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of having to deal with my mom. I'm tired of having to deal with my dad. I'm just, I'm ready to go. And I told my friend that was also into this, it's like, hey, you know what would be fun? I said, it's Mardi Gras. We can go to Mardi Gras. We can go to Louisiana. We can go to Mardi Gras. We can get away from here for a little bit. Give me a reset. And, of course, my mindset was, okay, well, my parents are probably going to be worried about me. I can still check in with them, but I want to get away. So we decided to pack up one night, and I was grounded, so I wasn't allowed to leave my house. That's why I was saying I wasn't a great kid. And um, I took my mom's cell phone. And because she was asleep, I took my mom's cell phone. I told her I was going to go walk the dogs and then come back home. What I did was I got on the cell phone, said, hey, come pick me up. I let my dogs loose to go back to the house. And then I ended up getting a ride to, like, downtown Plano-ish. I stayed at a hotel there overnight. That was the first time that I had seen my friend actually entertain men. And she tossed this skimpy little, like, nighty set to me. And it was like, I'm not putting that on in front of these guys. Like, I don't feel comfortable. And I got pressured into it. And, I mean, I think some of these guys were, like, 30, 40 years old. And a lot of them were buying alcohol. They had other girls there. Um, my friend was, like, hanging out with a whole bunch of these girls, like, kind of, like, hanging over them. They knew each other somehow. And I asked her, I was like, how do you know all these girls? She goes, oh, we hang out all the time. It's no problem. And she's like, you know, you get your cut out of the deal. They get the cut out of their deal. This is just, you know, how we do things. And I was like, Okay. This is a lot more than I thought it was. And I remember sitting down and talking with my trafficker, and I said, so after Mardi Gras, um, I'm going to probably go back home. And he goes, well, I thought that you were going to go with me and get away because you were so distraught. And I said, just let me have some time to think about it. And the more and more I, th I think back on my story, the more and more memories are coming back of the conversations that I had just prior to being taken. And the decisions I made leading up to that were some of the like worst decisions I think I've ever made in my life. Do I regret anything that I did up until that point? No, because it's gotten to me here. It's gotten me where 
I'm helping other people. It really sits there and, and changes a person's soul once they're trafficked because a part of you that wanted that normal life, that normal relationship, like I always had dreams of getting married and having a family and having a husband that's wonderful to me like my dad is to my mom. Um, I had a lot of dreams that were shattered with that and never were the same. And then I remember him handing me a bottle of water. And I remember taking a couple of sips out of this bottle of water while Evanescence was blaring on the radio. And um, every time I hear that song now, it, it, it throws me back into memories. And I can still remember the taste of the water and it was bitter. It didn't taste right. Something was wrong with it. And he promised me that it was okay, that it had been in his backpack, that it probably was the plastic taste. Um, and it was a weird brand. So I was just like, okay. I took several sips of it. And then, you know, the more and more I drank it, the more and more I became thirsty. And then I kind of started feeling drowsy. I remember falling asleep to um, to the album Fallen by Evanescence. And I remember the songs, like, kind of fading in and out for me. Um, I remember hearing him talking to me, but I couldn't make sense of what he was saying to me. Um, when I would start to wake up, he would kind of give me some more water. And again, I would take it and I would drink it and I would just make a face like, oh, this tastes awful. And at one point I kind of started fighting him on it. And he goes, no, you need to drink some water. Like you're sweaty. Like your body's really, really sweaty. It's really, really hot. And the car air conditioner wasn't working and it was warm in Texas. And so I was like, okay. I'll drink it. And as we started going throughout the night, I remember feeling kind of chilled and I fought him on the water. Um, I remember passing pine trees and then I remember hitting the Louisiana border. And I remember looking up and I'm like, oh, we're in Shreveport. Okay. I know where we are. Like my friend's grandmother lives over here. Um, why don't we stop here? for the night and get some rest and then continue the rest of the trip later. And my friend was adamant that we keep on going. And so I think after the third bottle of this water that, like I said, tasted awful, um, I fell asleep for a good while. And I remember waking up to the sun hitting me in the face. And I was out in the middle of this highway, and there was fields on either side of me. And I looked around, and I was kind of in shock. I was like, oh, where are we? And, like, we were trying to figure out on the map exactly where we were. And then we see a sign that says Alexandria, Louisiana. And so we looked, and we found where Alexandria was on the map. And we still had, like, three or 400 miles to go down to, like, New Orleans, like, New Orleans proper. I was like, we need to stop. Like, we need to find somewhere and take a break. Get You know, like, we've been driving all night. My friend's mother called her and it's like, where are you? And she's like, I'm here in Alexandria. I'm with friends. And her mom started yelling at her. And her, I guess, boyfriend, whatever he was, was with her. And then he exited the car. And I remember looking at my trafficker and saying, like, what are we going to do? We're supposed to go to Mardi Gras. And he's like, oh, we're going to go to Mardi Gras. We're going to figure this out. But 
we're going to have to figure out transportation. We may have to ride the bus. And I said, okay. He goes, well, I have about four or $500 in my pocket. Why don't we get a place to stay and hang out until we can find the bus station, find out how long it's going to take us. And I looked at my friend and I was all like, you're leaving me behind with somebody I don't even know. Like, why? I thought we were going to go to Mardi Gras and party. She's like, my mom said, if I don't get back to the house, that she's going to call the police and all this other stuff. And I said, okay, I'll stay. And at first he was really cordial with me. We were having conversations and he said, are you hungry? Yeah, I'm hungry. He's like, why don't we go get dinner? And we sat down at a Chinese restaurant, and I just kind of sat there, and I poured my heart out to him because I felt so incredibly alone at that point. And I was afraid because I knew that my parents knew that I was missing at that point. I was afraid of what they would think, what, um, what they would say if I called them. I had no way to call them at that point, but I was going to find a phone and, and call them. And we got done with the Chinese restaurant, and then we got back to the little, like, rundown motel. I guess you would call it motel. It was like a single-story, kind of older, 1950s-looking motel. And I remember walking into the room and looking around and being like, well, we could have done better with the money that we had, but okay, we're only going to be here for a night. I can deal with it. And he went outside and he smoked a cigarette and he came back in. And then he said, give me your wallet. What? Give me your wallet. Okay. I gave him my wallet and he proceeded to get out a pair of scissors and cut up my ID, cut up anything that had my identification on it. And then he said, close. And I said, close. He's like, yeah, close. I want your clothes. No, I don't. And he proceeded to hit me in the face and he said, take off your clothes. Okay. Um, he said, drink this bottle of water or I'll hit you again. I drank the bottle of water. I became very tired. He proceeded to get me into the shower, um, shower me, and then put me in a woman's nighty, like a overnight outfit. It was satin and lacy and see-through and everything that I was just like, I don't want to wear this. And he's all like, drink more of this water. And I would keep on trying to like throw it away from me. And he says, if you don't drink this water, I'm going to hit you again. And I remember he got me to the point where I couldn't really stand, much less, like, get up by myself. And he tied me to that bed. And he kept on force-feeding me that water. And some things I do remember, a lot I don't. Um, I remember waking up. I can still see his face above me. Um, I know that in the morning he would get up. He would force me to have a bottle of water. I'd fall asleep or I'd be kind of in and out of it. I remember his face being above me. I can still remember the smell of the cigarettes that he smoked. I remember the feeling of just being helpless. And I mean, he would throw me in the shower, make me change into a new outfit, throw out the old one and just keep going. Um, 
I know that another man came into the room at some point toward the end. I don't know how many men came into that room. I know that I still have memories of different faces, and I don't think I'll ever gain back full memory of that because when you're drugged, you, you don't have any memory. And I remember sitting there at one point when I became kind of cognizant of where I was. I could hear the housekeeper outside, but he had told me if I made any noise, any whatsoever, that he would find me and he'd kill me. And he would kill my family. He knew where I lived. On day five, he made me load his clothes into a basket. He put me in the outfit that I had arrived in. And he made me carry a laundry basket from Google Maps three miles to a laundromat. And I was able to actually find the laundromat online. Um, and I remember the outfits that he had put on me, some of them he had saved and still had price tags on them. And he said that he was working during the day, but I think he wasn't working. I think he was trying to get other men to sleep with me or rape me or do whatever they wanted to. Um, he would stay in the hotel with me at night. I know he would shower, but he made me carry all those clothes to a laundromat. And when we got to the door, he said, if you say anything to anybody, I will kill you. When we get back to the hotel, nobody will find you. Nobody will know you exist. He goes, the room next to us was condemned. He goes, I'll just leave your body there and then I'll leave. I said, okay. I won't say a thing. I remember he loaded all the laundry into the washer, and there was a woman that was standing nearby. I hadn't had any food in that time. He never fed me. He just gave me that nasty water the entire time. I felt sick. I felt sweaty. I felt awful. And I think this woman kind of caught on to the fact that I wasn't okay. And so she just kept on looking over at me, looking over at me, looking over at me. And then he looked at me and he goes, I have to go to the bathroom. Here's the change. He goes, you better be standing here when I get back. And so I sat down. At that point, the sleeves of my shirt and the bottoms of my pants were covering the like rub marks from the ropes that he used to hold me down. So she didn't see any of that. I think she saw maybe some of the like choke marks on my neck. And she kind of came up to me and dropped a quarter in front of me and then asked me if I was okay. And I looked at her and I said, no, I'm not okay. And he came out of the bathroom, and I guess he must have sat there and saw me talking to her. And he comes up, and he has this look on his face like, you're in trouble. Like, you're done. And he looked at the woman. He goes, why are you talking to her? She's like, she just dropped a quarter. She was just trying to put stuff into the dryer. And he looked at me, and he goes, no. He goes, we're done. He goes, you don't need to be talking to my little sister like that. You don't have any right to talk to my little sister. He grabbed everything, and he put it into the, to the basket. And I remember how heavy that thing was because the clothes were still, like, damp and wet. And I remember I walked back the three miles with that thing. And, I mean, I had to take breaks several times and set it down. And he would yell at me to pick it up, keep going, pick, you know, pick it up, keep going. Eventually tying a rope to it. And I, like, fashioned it 
onto my back. And I remember that was the longest walk back because I knew as soon as I got back, things were going to happen to me. Um, I think that woman must have knew something was going on or followed us because I still to this day kind of call her my guardian angel at this point. I don't know if she was law enforcement or if she was a police officer. I remember seeing uniforms. I don't know to this day who that person was, but she was the one that saved me because I think she made somebody aware that something was going on that didn't sound right. We got back to the motel and he took my clothes and he put me back into a nightie and it was relatively new. He assaulted me again. This time I remember every bit of it. And again, I just wanted to die. At that point, I was like praying, please just let me die. I'm tired. My body hurts. Um, I knew I was running a fever at that point. And he went to the bathroom and started showering off. And I started to hear kind of like shuffling outside of the door. And I looked over. He came out and he gave me another bottle of water and he's like, drink. And I said, okay. And I remember drinking half of it. And then I still remembered hearing the sound of like movement outside. And all of a sudden it, you hear bang, 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 bang. Alexandria police open up. He threw me into the next room that I don't know how he got unlocked and he put me into a closet and he said he'd make a sound. He goes, after I'm done, he goes, that's it. He goes, you've already sat there and did enough. He goes, you're dead to me. And I remember sitting in that closet and I thought, how is he going to kill me? Are my parents ever going to get my body? Are they ever going to find me? Is, is somebody going to look for me? And I think at that point, I just gave up all hope. And I sat silently in that closet. And I could hear shuffling around in the room. And I thought like he, because I could hear the door close. I thought he had left the room and went outside. And um, he was outside with the police. And the police looked at me after they found me. It was because I sneezed. I, I sneezed. And the police found me wrapped me in a coat and, and took me outside. He was outside. I still remember the police officer's face. I still remember him starting to cry as he carried me out. I still remember being put in the back of a squad car. And I still remember being questioned by the police what had happened, and I kept on telling them nothing, nothing. I ran away. I ran away, but I don't want to go home. I don't want to go back to my parents. I'm scared that they're going to get mad at me. I was ashamed of what had been done to me. And after that, I was put in a holding cell at a correctional facility. And I remember... Um, it was then that we found out that I had really bad kidney infection and, and other things. My parents came two days later. I got to sit in a cell looking out a window. And I felt very alone the entire time. And then when my parents picked me up, I got to endure the biggest chew-out session that I'd ever had in my life. Which, as a parent, I get it. But as somebody that just survived hell, all I needed was somebody to hug me. And I don't know what happened to him except for he got extradited to Texas. 
Um, he spent 90 days in a state jail. 90 days for what he did to me. If I would have went to court, he probably would have gotten federal charges, but I was too afraid to face him again. And I don't think if I saw his face again that I could look at him as a human being. I would call him for the monster that he was and what he took from me. I'm working with survivors of human trafficking. I help find them. Um, I'm currently studying criminal justice. I'm already a survivor advocate. I work with women who have gone through the same thing as I do. It's part of the healing process. First recognizing that you've been trafficked was the biggest step. And I don't really think it made sense to me until I met my friend Stephanie. And she told me that everything that had happened to me is classic trafficking, except this was like one of the worst cases. It's kind of like the movie Taken or, um, you know, where you were like kidnapped, you were taken from your home, your family, everything. A lot of times it's not like that. A lot of these women and girls are taken by family members. They're taken by a mom that can't make rent, so they sell their daughter to whoever to make enough money to pay the rent. Or you've got a girl that had a really bad home that ran away and lives basically on the streets and will find somebody that needs that love and attention just like I did. You'll find girls, young girls, that get trapped up in gangs, and they become property to that gang, and they'll do anything for the man that they're with because their life's on the line. Um, I saw the lot after I was trafficked. I lived in a drug house. I knew how the women were treated. I, on the other hand... I became very violent because of it. But at the same time, any woman that needed my help, I was there. Ask me how I'm doing now. It's a mixture between I love what I do. I love helping these women because it it gives me a sense of peace that I'm doing something to end their hell just a little bit faster and make it easier on them. And then at the same time, it brings things back to life for me sometimes. There's nights that I can't sleep. There's nights that, like, believe it or not, church bells or Phoenix, or Axe Phoenix, the body spray, I can't ever smell that body spray again. If I smell it, I, I automatically go into hysterics. You live in limbo. It's somewhere between heaven and hell. You know that there's so many women out there that need you, that are stuck, just like I was, that are crying out for help, that need somebody. And they're right in front of us. They are right in front of us. They're right down the street. I can guarantee you if I walked down South First right now, I could find a hotel room that had a trafficking victim in it. There's I-20. One of the largest highways through Texas, other than I-10. And people are being trafficked up and down that road every day. And nobody, nobody's aware of it. For youth... A lot of it is home life. Are you there for your kids? Are you actively listening to what they're saying to you? Are you able to have what I call the open door? The open door is important. 
especially for children. If you are a working parent, I get it. It's hard to balance both work and life. But have an open door. If your child needs you, don't ever shut your door on your child. Be there for them. If your child has a problem, be attentive to their needs. A lot of kids get caught up in middle school and high school. What I'm seeing with my own children, what I'm hearing from my own children, are that there's already drugs in school, that kids are dealing drugs, that kids are handing out drugs, that our girls are becoming pregnant, that girls are hanging out with older men, that girls are becoming involved in gangs, that there's a huge homeless, huge homeless need, like, baseline. There's at least uh, 192 the last time I heard, 192 unaccompanied, or unaccompanied youth at this point, 192 children that are homeless. That is a target for a human trafficker. A young child that has no adult, no one to guide them, they are targets. That's the, that's what you hear, like, when you think of the movie um, that just came out recently, Sound of Freedom. That's what you will see, like, the teenager going off and traveling and stuff like that and getting on a plane and then getting taken um, I mean, you have different movies that kind of portray what trafficking is, but they miss out on what was missing. And a couple of youth obviously need a trust base. Eventually, they become women. They're broken. Our boys become men. They're broken. They don't have anybody they can trust or that they feel loves them. And a lot of times, gangs, women that don't have high health, like self-esteem, their health is in, you know, dire straits, um, financial situations, anything that you can think of, a single mom needing some money, you know, can get into trafficking and end up being pimped out by a man several nights a week. Um here where I live in Abilene, I know a lot of the strip clubs have women that are used by men that get money off the club. I know that there's several women that go to local motels, and that's where they go. I know that there's children out here that are runaways that get caught up with grown adult men or grown adult women. Women can be traffickers as well. In fact, it's not uncommon for a woman to be a tra trafficker to a young male. You don't hear about it as much, but it's still there. Warning signs that somebody's being trafficked. Obviously, um, if you see an older adult with a younger child that doesn't quite fit, you can also look for markings on their neck. A lot of times traffickers will tattoo or brand their women. They'll be in need of health care. Something will happen. They'll need basic needs like haircut. They'll go get their nails done. And a lot of times they're being followed by their trafficker. And the trafficker will pay for this. And then they pay back by being trafficked. You won't really see any, like, blatant outward signs. It's very well hidden and concealed. But if you listen really hard, especially, like, police officers, nurses, doctors, nail salons, massage parlors, anything else like that, those are all areas right now that are being used to smuggle people in and be used. A lot of this happens behind closed doors. Law enforcement misses it. Even people every day miss it. You won't even know. Like you could pass by somebody and they have been raped five times that day. There, I will tell you as a human trafficking survivor, I'm very shy. 
kind of got a social anxiety. So I'm a extroverted introvert. So I can sit there and I can hold a conversation with you, but at the same time, in the back of my mind, I'm like, I want to be home right now. I don't want to be here. I'm scared because I don't know where I'm at. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know who I'm dealing with. A lot of times we're very shy and we're very quiet and we're very, like, to ourselves. That's because we've been taught to stay silent, to not say a word. We're in fear of our lives. We owe too much money. We haven't paid back a debt. They know where our family lives. They're going to kill them. It can be anything that keep us silent. But what needs to be seen is maybe the police need to pay a little bit more attention to what happens in those hotels at night. Maybe put somebody there. Or maybe they need to do a sting operation one night and see what's really going on. Because when you're a survivor, when you've gone through this, typically you can see the signs in people. I can kind of look at somebody and assess them and say, something's not right. I've made calls to the human trafficking hotline. I've said, hey, I saw this person, this person. A woman came in the other day to a local ER, and she was seeking treatment for what she thought was kidney stones. And I saw a tattoo on the back of her neck, and it was of a barcode. That's one of the tattoos that you look for. Or a little, like, crown, or it can be a little diamond, or it can be even the marking of a gang. And... I alerted the staff and I said, hey, I think she's being trafficked. I called the trafficking hotline and said, hey, I think I found you a trafficking victim. And it was at an ER, of all places. It's right in front of us. And what's, what breaks my heart is that there's so many of them out there right now. There's so many of them out there right now that need to be let go of, be free, and they're stuck. They don't have a voice. So they need to just be able to see somebody being a voice for them. I survived it. I got out of it. I've been through that hell, and there's a way out. You don't have to sit there and have to worry about your life. You can get away. You don't have to sit there and worry about being his property anymore. You're worth more than gold and diamonds. I have a big faith in God, and I believe that we are far more worth the riches of this earth than could ever be measured. So to those that are being trafficked right now, Your worth is more than this world can give to you. You're worth more than the stars in the sky, and you have somebody that loves you unconditionally. You don't have to sit there and sell yourself. You don't have to sell yourself because you're worth more than that. There's jobs. I know it's hard. It's hard to find work. It's hard to find something that's going to pay the bills. You want to make sure your kids are safe. You want to make sure that you have good living. You're having problems with your mom who may be a drug addict or drunk, or your dad may be abusing your mom, or you're trying to get away from situations. But there's always help places. You can get away. You just have to look for the right people. And there are resources out there. There's a human trafficking hotline, police stations, Find somebody, a first responder, anybody, and say, I need help. Because until you say something, you're going to stay stuck. I think it was that woman that saved my life. Maybe somebody at the hotel noticed something. I still believe it was that woman that said something for me. And like I said, I have a guardian angel. I'll, I'll never know her name. Never be able to find her. I still have that 
police officer's brain in the back, like, or, like the picture of his face in the back of my brain. And it's just one of those things that just make you go. I don't know what he was feeling at that point, but I think he was absolutely and totally destroyed. But there's hope if more people would speak up about it. And I'm talking to survivors as well. If you'd speak up, if you'd tell your story, I know it's scary to bring back those memories, but if you would speak up and your voices would get louder, we can make this end. I mean, we could. We could shut down this whole entire industry if we would just simply say something and start sharing our stories and start putting it in people's faces. Talking's the first thing. And then advocating, being out there, holding somebody's hand, getting them out of the situation, reminding them that they are worth something is so important to ending this. Get involved in your local community. If they have a human trafficking resource, they'll be able to sit there and they'll be able to guide you on where to go next, how to advocate, how to sit there and be, you know, there for these women, funding, obviously, to build safe houses for us because there's not a lot of places we can go after we're trafficked. It's either the hospital or jail at this point. That's kind of our options because a lot of us get prostitution charges. So if you see somebody, just say something that it just catches you off guard, say something.